So um, you headlined WrestleMania 13 against The Undertaker in the WWE title match when you went into the event as champion. And um, how much did it mean to you to get to headline such a prestigious event? Now, this to be honest truth, um, that was my second WrestleMania. To me, WrestleMania, whatever, the first one I was with Hogan, mm. Wrestle 13 with him, that was not any bigger event than it would have been if I was wrestling an Undertaker knows this. About, and we always had a match. We had a match that we were trying to get out real quick. We'd call, call it Code Fresno. And that was from Fresno, California. means there's not a lot of people here. Let's get out here for the main <laughs> event. Uh, but I had, you know, every one of those nights, it'd be Code Fresno or it'd be in WrestleMania. was still a very important night for mm -hmm. me. Again, I wasn't your typical wrestler. No, I didn't grow up watching this stuff. I got into it. I met Randy Savage and these guys in the gym. I was trying to get into the USFL Football League. And uh, they said, hey, man, you make $50,000 a year. I went, whoa, I had a kid on the way, so that's what I did. So I have a little different out, you know, view, uh, view on things that your typical wrestler would have. So again, I, when people told me after WrestleMania, they go, how was WrestleMania with Hogan? I go, oh, uh, where was that at? It was Indianapolis. And I really, I don't recall it being any different night. And that's the honest truth about that. Uh, you also you headlined Madison Square Garden Survivor Series '96 against Shawn Michaels right. when you won the belt. Right. Um, again, just trying to sum up how, what that was like because the crowd went nuts for you that night. That was the one thing watching that match back recently. Shawn was the face and you were the heel, right. but you were fist bumping fans on the way to the ring. They exploded for you, and Shawn got more of a mixed reaction. It seemed like how did that personally for you? How, how, what was well, that like? This is the thing that really that part is. This is the thing is in the Northeast, and that's where the Garden is now. The Garden. It's got real special, uh, special for me, and to the point where you know, my, my blood pressure is always 110 over 60, 110 over 70. When I was there, it was almost they wouldn't let me go on, and I don't know why it was like that. Um, and the two, the garden is in New York, and that's the Northeast. So in the Northeast, the bad guy is usually cheered, especially over someone like Sean, who is the typical pretty boy. Yeah. Because the New Yorkers will spit on you for that, you know, and that's the truth. So, but what did make a really what did mean a lot to me about that match was this. Now, I had taken a year off because I broke my neck and I came back and I, I was working with Vader and we were working the Madison Square Garden like a month or so before that pay-per-view. And um, I was actually not a heel. At that point in WWF, I was heel. I'd work with Vader one night, mm -hmm. then I would work with Shawn Michaels the next night. Right, okay. I was the first guy that was doing that. In between. I was in between. So um, that wasn't it wasn't out of the norm, so, but a lot of times when I came to a, a building in the Northeast, I could tell who I was working with because they were disappointed because good guys or baby faces hate to be booed. <laughs> yeah. No, a bad guy, we don't mind if we get cheered. We love to get booed, but the cheers are there too, no big deal. But you could tell they hated that because baby faces hate being booed. But what really did mean this to me was um, Vince came to me about a month and we were in the gardens and said, hey, we want you to put Vader over tonight because we're going to have Vader. Uh, become champion here at SummerSlam. And I said, okay, um, um, sure, why not? So I went out and put Vader over, over that night. Now, just so happens that I'm walking through the curtains, I see Vince McMahon sitting there. And he's, you know, Vince has always hated me. He looked at me like, like this, and so we got back to the dressing room, and I told Bob Holly and a couple other guys, I said, I'll be the next champion. I'll be the champion at SummerSlam. So I was supposed to lose to Vader in your house in Indianapolis and Vader was going to do the main event at the, at the SummerSlam. Right. So we got to Indianapolis and they pulled me in the office and said, we're going to put you over tonight. I said, I already knew that. <laughs> See, I guess having a different perspective than a wrestler, I never look at a booking sheet, I didn't know who I was working with, I didn't care. It was just another night, it was a, you know, try to you know, do the best you could do. That to me was the greatest achievement maybe in my life too. Uh, Force Pence's hand like that. <laughs> so you mentioned that you said that Vince hates you. Why? Because he put the title on you and gave you, you know, you had some big men, you know, he worked with Hogan at WrestleMania. It's a funny way, if, if he did hate it's a funny way of showing well, it. It is, but this is the thing is, I, I, I'm not trying to be cocky, it's just, I'm, I think I was that valuable to the business. I'm one of the people that I stayed on top and drew all the time. I wasn't on top for one part of my career, I was on top all the time. In the WWF, it really, that's how you made your money. In WCW, you just had guaranteed contracts. So, think about Vince, even that night, at that pay-per-view, I was supposed to hit Jose Lothario with a camera. Yeah. And so I told Vince, I said, that's the stupidest effing thing I've ever heard. And I said, the deal is, I said, let me beat him with my finish, 
When we go to the Alamo Dome, the Alamo Dome is his hometown, they wanted to put the belt back on him there. I said, and I'll let him beat me with his finish, not a t chair or something like that. They said, well, we need this. But anyway, I would probably was the first person to always tell Vince how stupid he could be sometimes. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned Vader then as well, you obviously sadly recently passed away, um, one of the greatest workers of all time, yes. not just big man work but no. in general in, across the board, um, what was he like to work with because he was such a sort of transformative star in terms of what he could do as a, you know, at 400 pounds he was doing moonsaults, everything else, like how much did he help you in your career and what was he like to work with? I'll tell you a couple of stories, first of all, I compared him and Bam Bam Bigelow together. They're both the same. Uh, big guys could do a lot of things. Now, Vader, and what I liked about both of them were they were workhorses, meaning, and nothing against, you know, Mark. I had took my nights off too, but there was no Code Fresno with under with uh, with Bigelow mm -hmm. or Vader. It was all out every night, which I, I enjoy that. Yeah. So um, working with him was great. Now I'll tell you a funny story about him. He really was a perfectionist, and, and he was so nervous about it. He threw up every night before his performance. And he always had the smell of vomit on his breath. But a great guy. But uh, so we were in a show one night, and uh, I called the silly spot. I, I never do sunset flip, so I kicked him in the gut and said sunset flip, and then dropped down on me. And he did it. And so uh, we get back to the dressing room. <laughs> he says, "Sid, give me a talk to you a second. What was that out there tonight?" I said, uh, "I don't know. I was, I was just thought about a sunset flip." He goes, "That worked really hard to make you look like a million dollars." I said, "Yes, Leon. Always." He goes. Don't ever do that again. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sid Richards, thank you so much for being here today with Wrestling Travel. It means so much to us. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoy the rest of your stay in Liverpool. Thank you.